What we're aiming to do in this section is to build on findings gained during the history part of the interaction with the patient. Before we move on to the components of the physical examination, I'm just going to point to some of the anatomy of the spinal column because this will be pertinent to the findings in the physical examination. The spine, as we know, is composed of the vertebral bodies at the front and interposed between these are the discs. Posteriorly, we have the lamina and lying underneath those are the neural elements. I think it's a useful exercise when you're examining a patient to think of the potential areas where pathology can arise. They can be coming from the musculoskeletal structures themselves, that's to say the vertebral bodies and the discs, or posteriorly the facet joints, or the patient may have neurological compromise due to compression of the spinal cord higher up or due to the coda and the other nerve roots lower down in the lumbar spine. Examination of the patient's spine, as for other orthopaedic systems, begins with inspection. I start by having the patient standing and the first thing we're going to assess is the patient's sagittal alignment. Looking at the patient from the side, you can see that if a plumb line is dropped from the external auditory meatus, it should bisect the hip and in physical terms that lies at the level of the greater trochanter here. And you can see in this patient's case, his spine is balanced, that's to say his head lies directly over his sacrum. The other thing that's noteworthy here is the thoracic kyphosis and lumbar lordosis. And the fact that this line bisects the greater trochanter indicates that his spine is balanced. The next step is to assess the coronal alignment of the patient's spine. And this is done by assessing an imaginary plumb line from the level of the C7 vertebra down to the sacrum. And this should essentially bisect the sacrum. If the patient has a condition such as scoliosis, where there is imbalance, the plumb line will deviate off to the side. And one can measure this displacement in terms of centimetres. The next component of the physical examination is to have the patient flex forward. And in this, we're looking for two things. Firstly, to assess the stability and flexibility of the patient's lumbar spine. And secondly, looking for thoracic rotation in the setting of scoliosis. So just get you to bend forward there for me, Brian. In this scenario, Brian is reaching his ankles at the moment, indicating a normal degree of lumbar flexibility. And we can also see that his thoracic spine is flat here, indicating that there's no thoracic rotation and no underlying scoliosis in this situation. The next component to examination is inspection. And in the setting of cervical spine disease, we may see wasting of the musculature of the upper extremities and shoulder girdle musculature. Looking at Brian from the front here, you can see that his deltoid musculature and biceps are normal. Brian, I'll just get you to adopt a position like Arnold Schwarzenegger, bring your two arms up. And you can see both his biceps and pectoralis major are well developed bilaterally with no atrophy. And if you can just turn right around for me now, Look at you from the back, bring your two arms forward like this. And you can see again that he's got symmetry of his rotator cuff musculature bilaterally, indicating no signs of any wasting and no underlying neurological compromise. We're now going to assess the flexibility of Brian's cervical spine. So Brian, what I'll get you to do is just to put your chin on your chest for me, right the way down. Look right up towards the ceiling for me. And he's got full flexion and extension there. Look straight ahead, Brian. Look over your left shoulder for me now over to your right shoulder, look straight ahead. So lateral rotation is uh, normal and symmetrical. Put your left ear on your left shoulder for me now and right ear on your right shoulder. And again, a symmetrical amount of lateral flexion of his cervical spine. The next test that we'll move on to is Sporling's test, looking for exit foraminal stenosis in the cervical spine. So Brian, I'll get you to put your left ear on your left shoulder again, and I'm going to compress axially down on, on Brian's skull here trying to uh, impede one of the exit foramen, and this may uncover entrapment of a cervical nerve root. And what I'd expect to see here, if Brian does have a cervical nerve root entrapment, is increase in pain going down his arm. The next component of the physical examination is neurological evaluation. Initially, we're going to examine the upper extremities, and we've already outruled muscular atrophy in Brian's case. What we're going to focus on here is sensory, motor, and reflex evaluation. So Brian, I'll just get you to adopt that sort of posture with your hands. So the first dermatone to assess is the C5 dermatone, which lies over the deltoid. Obviously, you're assessing both sides, looking for asymmetry in terms of what the patient feels. So that feels the same on both sides, Brian. Come on. So C5 is the deltoid. C6 is the thinner eminence. We're going to assess that on both sides. Again, asking the patient as we go if there's any asymmetry in terms of what they feel. C7 is the middle finger. C8 is the hypothenar eminence, and T1 is the inside of the biceps. You may want to continue the examination down over the patient's trunk, uh, T4 being the level of the nipple, 
T10 being the level of the umbilicus, looking again for asymmetry in terms of sensory innervation. The next component is the motor exam. Brian, I'll just get you to hold your hands like that again for me. Bring your arms up to the side here and keep them in that position. Don't let me move them. So I'm going to push down here. You can see here that Brian is able to resist me easily, indicating on the MRC grading that he's a 5 over 5 power in his deltoids, which are uh, innervated by the C5 myotome. Brian, if you can adopt that position with your arms. Here we're assessing the biceps again. This is the C5 nerve root. Again, Brian has normal power, 5 over 5. The next is the C6 myotome, which is wrist dorsiflexion. So, Brian, if you can do that with both wrists, just bring them back like that for me on both sides. And again, you're comparing like with like, looking for asymmetry and potential weakness on either side. C7 is the triceps. So, Brian, I want you to do that with both arms. Just push me away. Come on, try the same here again. Come on. Again, normal power. C8 is flexion of the middle finger. So I'll get you to bend your middle finger like you're hanging on to a ledge is typically what I say to patients. You can see here that Brian has normal power preservation. Finally, T1 is the interosseous. So just get you to abduct the fingers, keep them in that position. Same both sides. And again, Brian is preserved in that respect. Examination of the reflexes in the upper extremity is the next component. We're going to assess the reflexes at the level of the elbow, C5-6 over the bicipital tendon. Over the distal wrist, again, C5-6. And finally, over the triceps. And this is best achieved by holding the patient's forearm over your own forearm, forearm taking the weight of the arm, allowing the triceps uh, tendon to relax, and striking over the, the tendon here, trying to elicit the triceps reflex. One component of this examination that's particularly useful is trying to elicit upper motor neuron signs. And this is, can be done by the brachio, brachioradialis reflex in the wrist, where you'll see the thumb uh, flexing if there is spinal cord compression. The other reflex that's worth assessing in this respect is Hoffman's reflex, and this is undertaken by grasping the patient's middle finger, much as you would a cigarette between your index and middle finger, and flicking the distal phalanx with your thumb. Examination of the lower extremities from the neural standpoint follows a similar pattern, looking at sensory and motor examination prior to moving on to reflex examination. There's a number of well-defined dermatones in terms of the lower extremities. The L2 dermatone lies over the anterior thigh. As per the upper extremities, we're going to ask the patient, has he any asymmetry on testing this level? So that feels the same both sides, Brian. The L3 is over the anterior aspect of the patella. Again, no difference there. L4 is over the medial aspect of the malleolus, over the medial malleolus, I should say. The L5 is in the first web space, both sides, and S1 is typically just over the lateral malleolus and also over the lateral aspect of the calf. So again, they felt the same both sides. Good man. So what I'll get you to do now, Brian, is to bring your knee up towards the ceiling for me. Keep it up strong. Don't let me push down. This is the L2 myotone. Again, you assess the other side then, looking for asymmetry in terms of power. That's normal on both sides. I'll get you to straighten your knee for me now. So we're assessing the L3 myotome, the knee extensors here, both sides. No obvious asymmetry between the two sides. Can I get you to bring your ankle back up towards the ceiling, both sides for me? This is the L4 uh, myotome, or the anterior tibialis. Again, well preserved on both sides. The extensor hallucis longus, or the extensors of the great toe, are the L5 myotome, assessing this on both sides and Brian is, is normal on both sides. And finally, just get you to push your two feet down towards the floor. We're looking at the S1 myotome here, the gastrosoleal complex, the ankle flexors here for the S1 uh, myotome. And again, Brian is normal in all those modalities. We'll now move on to reflex assessment. Over the anterior aspect of the knee, if you grab the patella like this, you can see that the patellar tendon is just below this level. And we're looking for asymmetry again. This is the uh, L3-4 and over the uh, Achilles tendon on both sides, looking for the ankle jerk, which would be S1-2. And you can see there that it's quite easy to elicit in the seated position. We then look for the Babinski reflex, scratching the sole of the foot, which the patient always enjoys, you can see here in Brian's case. And you, you expect to see plantar flexion of the great toe in the normal setting. If the patient has potential spinal cord compression, you may see an uh, upgoing plantar, which would be indicative of that. Clonus is another useful test to elicit, and in this scenario here, we're going to move the patient's foot a number of times just to re relax the ankle flexors and extensors, and then sharply 
dorsiflex the ankle. More than three beats of clonus is considered pathological in this setting. Again, a sign of a potential upper motor neuron situation. In the setting of a patient potentially presenting with sciatica, the straight leg raise is a very useful test. This is undertaken as a passive test, passively lifting the patient's involved leg. It's important to look at the patient's faces. They may not communicate to you that they're in discomfort, and you elevate the leg until the patient is in discomfort. Brian looks like he's in some discomfort now, as you can see from his broad smile. Uh, to further enforce this, Lesegue's test involves passively dorsiflexing the patient's ankle. And what we're doing here is enhancing the stretch of the sciatic nerve and potentially worsening a scenario where there's a disc prolapse pressing on one of the nerve roots supplying the sciatic nerve. So that really wraps up the spinal examination. I'd recommend examining the patient initially in the standing position, looking at the overall alignment of the spine, looking at the patient's um, sagittal and coronal balance, and then moving on to placing the patient in a seated position, undertaking neurological exa examination prior to finishing things up with the patient lying supine here for any uh, sciatic nerve tests that you may wish to do.